to another episode of the Running Tales podcast with me, Craig Lewis. This week on the podcast, we seek to tell the extraordinary stories of everyday runners, race walkers and wheelchair racers. I've been talking to Claudia Burrows. Claudia's running journey only started after she went to Bushy Park Run as part of a This Girl Can event. But after initial uncertainty, she found herself drawn to the sport. But as her time started to improve, she also began to feel a shakiness in her legs that would lead to her having to take part firstly on crutches and eventually in a wheelchair. Undaunted, Claudia started on a new journey, one that has taken her to the heat and hills of South Africa's Comrades Ultra via COVID challenges and the London Marathon. I started our chat by asking her how she had first came to love running. I wasn't particularly keen on running. I was more sports. I was more interested in playing sports, team sports. The idea of sort of going out for a run was kind of, I just really struggled. I'd run what I felt like was 5K and I'd look at my like app that I had at the time and it'd be like, you've run half a kilometre. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean about you run half a kilometre? Um, and I kind of just dipped in and out of it because I was like, oh, I should probably do more running. Um, just to get fitter for playing sports. I played like hockey at university, I played ultimate frisbee um, and lots of different sports. So I was very much, it was kind of a, a thing to get fit for playing those. I wasn't really interested in running at all. Yeah, I'd probably, I've got that like short attention span where I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then I'd start it and be like, actually, uh, I don't really like this. Um, and I'd do it for like a week and then I'd stop. And then the university that I was at at the time um, did a like this girl can uh, campaign and one of the things was a park run on the Saturday morning and there was a competition run by the university so the most of each sport athletes that from each sports club that attended any of the events there was a prize at the end and I'm quite competitive so I was like right okay we've got to go and do the park run on the Saturday and actually only about four of us turned up to do this and I did my first park run uh, which felt like it might as well have been a half marathon. It was so far. I didn't have any clue how far 5K was. I didn't know if, like, I didn't even check out the route beforehand. I didn't know which corner. I was like, keep running. And I didn't know which corner we were going to go to and where the finish was going to be. It was just, like, baffling. And I sort of, I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest. I I suppose I enjoyed it more than I enjoyed, like, going out for a run on my own. But I didn't enjoy that feeling of being absolutely, like, like really heavily deep breathing really struggling obviously like there's people there that are like running straight past you who are like really young and you're like this is insane this is crazy but yeah so I wasn't I wasn't taken by it but at the time my mum was quite ill she had cancer she'd been diagnosed in the May and this was in the November and I finished the park run and I received a phone call from my dad to say that she was pretty poorly and then on the, the day after I did my first park run so on the Sunday um, in the evening she passed away and that week was a really strange week obviously I was still doing university I had a lot going on trying to sort of come to terms with everything that was going on it sort of got to the Thursday and the Friday and it was like someone said oh you're gonna go to parkrun again and I thought yeah yeah I'm gonna go so I went I think I enjoyed it more the second time because I sort of knew what was going to happen I knew where the finish was (laughs) um I got faster yeah I was faster so that was good because I'm like competitive so I was like I want to be faster and I went every week every yeah I went every week then for probably a year every Saturday I went and it became things like oh I want my 50 shirt I I want a shirt like them I want to do that so that was the next sort of big thing I want to get my time down and then I started running outside of parkrun so I kind of did that flip where I'd started running outside parkrun stopped running went to parkrun and then started running outside of parkrun. I thought, oh, I could get quite good at this. And I was getting my times down at parkrun. I think I started at a 30 minute. And then I think my fastest ever running parkrun was a 22.51. Um, and I was taking like 30 seconds off every other week. So I was doing like, all right. I thought, oh, I want to do the marathon. I want to do London marathon. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I think big. I don't just be like, oh, I'll do something small. But it had always been my dream to do London Marathon. Like ever since I watched it as like as a kid, like every year I'd watch it and I'd be like, I want to do that. So I signed up for the London Marathon and then I got my place confirmed for the 2019 London Marathon. 
So this was now back in 2018, obviously, you get your place confirmed the year before. Uh, and it was about four weeks later that um, I started having quite severe symptoms in my legs, um, which eventually led to me being in a wheelchair. And that was, yeah, then that was the end of sort of like that running journey. So just before we move on, perhaps to to, to that stage of, of your story, I, I just yeah. want to go back and think about part run a little bit more because it has got this fantastic community spirit and I wonder if that was what got you into the running there particularly it it sounds and correct me if I'm wrong again that it helped you to cope with your mum's death at that time and 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 then suddenly before you realized that you actually liked running as well yeah yeah that, that community spirit I think when I first started and I was running I didn't appreciate that as much it, i would turn up because at this point i was going on my own to park run so i'd go i'd get up early on a saturday morning my housemates would still be asleep i'd go to park run i'd come back and they'd probably still be asleep but i wouldn't hang around or anything i would i didn't really talk to many people i didn't know anyone there like my first park run was bushy park run so we're talking thousands of people so it's not exactly like a small park run where you know you might notice people like it was so many people which i quite enjoyed because i felt like i blended in like I didn't have that anxiety around like, oh, people are looking at me, people are staring at me because there were thousands of people there. So you just blend in and I would leave straight after. I think I only really appreciated park run for the community aspect when I couldn't run because it came less about the time. Oh, I need to get a good time. I need to get a good time. And then it became, I just want to finish. And I took my headphones out and I would actually listen to what everyone was saying around me and I'd talk to the tail walkers and I'd talk to the volunteers and that community aspect like was was huge. But it was only after I think that I like was on it was when I was on crutches that I really appreciated how like the community aspect of Parkrun. And before that it's something that I just sort of ignored, I suppose. Naively, I think, at the time. But I just I just wanted to run. <laughs> Yeah, you, it sounds you, you were there to to help your fitness and just get yeah. out there and run and get get faster. Yeah. When you started to have these sort of pains in your legs and so on, did did you have any clue what it was straight away and what it was going to lead to? I didn't know what it was going to lead to. I'd been having like tests at the hospital for quite a few years beforehand, so it wasn't. I suppose it wasn't a surprise, but it also was a bit of a shock because I thought oh, it's just a bit bad at the moment, it was going to get better. So I I suppose, yeah, I didn't, I thought I'd just do, I'll just be on crutches for a couple of weeks and then I'll just be fine and I'll be running again. I mean, I've been injured. I'm so injury prone, like playing sports growing up. I think I was, my my parents have to take me to A&E at least like once every three months because I'd break something. I'd do, me and my brothers, you know, playing sports in the garden, whatever it was, I'd injure myself. So I was quite used to one being like on crutches and two, just sort of like bouncing back, I think. I'd just always, whatever had happened, I'd always just come back and just carried on as normal. I wasn't worried, I suppose, in a sense, because I was like, oh, it would just be fine. And then obviously the weeks and the months pass and things haven't improved and they start to get a bit worse. And I think that realisation sort of hits home a bit then. And are you, are you happy telling people what, what the condition is that you have now and, and what that means for you? Yeah, so, so I don't have one condition, which I suppose is the problem. And I've still got loads of tests and stuff. So even like four years down the line, I still don't have like a, this is it, which is crazy. But I suppose you have to consider, obviously, with like pandemic and stuff, everything's been delayed. So, but essentially, my condition means that I have quite stiff legs. And it also means that my sensation in my legs is limited, as well as in my lower arms. So I can't feel any of my feet. My muscles are quite tight. I also have like joint dislocations and stuff like that. So dislocating my knees and, and elbow, well, lesser elbows, more like shoulders and stuff. So so that's kind of what it entails. What it is, is a mixture of things. But it's, yeah, it's quite complicated. No, that's fine. And, and I mean, how much of a, a shock was it for someone who is obviously very, very sporty, very into uh, your fitness, getting more and more into your running to, to suddenly have this realisation that, what you thought might just be stiffness for a couple of weeks, a couple of months was was going to be a longer term thing to deal with. I don't actually know at which point I realised that this was this was it. I was on crutches for about five months or so and I was carrying on on crutches, like life just carried on. I went to Parkrun and it, it was almost quite the same as when I started Parkrun when I realised that I just can go f- as fast as I can go but on crutches instead. 
And I got my time down to like sub 35 on crutches. And I was like chuffed to bits with that. But it was that competitiveness just carried on. So I think I was just like, well, I'm going to do this now. And then like, I'll go back to running. But it just, I mean, it did decline. There was a moment of like, well, there was a couple of moments of realisation, I think, when like, I think I distinctly remember like being on a bus and I would fall over quite frequently because I just don't have the balance. And I fell over on the bus. I just slammed, hit the floor on the bus. And I was helped up by like an elderly lady and she sort of helped me up. And and I think that was quite, as a 20 something, early 20 something year old, that was quite a bit of a, like it hit home just how bad things were. Like that an elderly lady was helping up and giving up her seat so that I could sit down. And I was like, this shouldn't be how it is. Yeah, that really hit home maybe the severity. But I think I also just carried on and it was only... Like, I mean, I destroyed shoes because I was dragging them my feet along the ground. And it was just like, I just, again, just ignored it and just sort of carried on. And then it was only because I had a place in the Royal Parks half marathon. And I was like, I'll just do it on crutches. No issue. Right. Whatever happens, happens. I'll do it on crutches. And they said I couldn't. And I was like, well, why can't I, why can't I do it on crutches? Like, I'm totally proficient to do it on crutches. And they said, you can't do it on crutches. The only way you can do it is if you use a wheelchair. And I was like, well, I'm not using a wheelchair. Like, that's not happening. And they basically said, I said, absolutely not. Like the only way you can do it is if you do it in a wheelchair. And London Marathon had sort of said the same thing. So I was like, well, I still want to do those. I was like, and it had been mentioned by like medical professionals about the the possibility of using a wheelchair because I was falling over so much. And then turn that was like injuring my knees. And if anything, I was causing myself more harm. We looked at it and I just purchased like a second hand chair that I was going to use purely to do the Royal Parks half in and do the London Marathon in. And I got it and I couldn't push 10 metres. I couldn't push at all. It was horrendous. And I think well, I've my best friend, we've lived together for like six years, I think now. But I think that's the closest we've ever come to our friendship. Just blowing up was when I first started using a chair because she wanted to help me. I was getting frustrated by the things that I couldn't do. And we just had so many like coming togethers over it. But once I quite got, I started training, I suppose. I started training for like the Royal Parks, I got better, I got stronger, which was great. And I sort of realised that actually being in a wheelchair probably wasn't the end of the world because I could now go out all day and do like all the things I wanted to do. Whereas before I was having to sort of limit myself because I wouldn't be able to stand up for as long or I can't go on the bus because of like what if I fall over and what if there's no seat, like things like that. So actually my wheelchair gave me a huge sense of freedom. I mean, there were loads of challenges, but I felt sort of free as well whilst using it i think people look at a wheelchair as like the end of the world and actually for me at that time and obviously now and now i I can't walk at all i can't can't stand up um unaided but at the time it was actually the best piece of equipment for me for to be able to live a a semi-normal life how far along your sort of training for that first half did you get with that basic wheelchair? Because I'm not an expert on these things, but there's a big difference between a proper racing wheelchair and something you might buy secondhand. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't like a hospital chair that I bought secondhand. It was quite similar to, I mean, in many ways, quite similar to the day chair I have now. And I used that same chair for every race that I did for two or three years. It's only recently that I've actually got a new chair. So it kind of, it looked like your standard sort of day wheelchair, I'd say, like that you see most most day wheelchairs using. It wasn't wasn't massively clunky. But my first thing was, so this would have been August 2018 that I first got my chair. And the half marathon was October. So not long, really. No. But my first aim was to do parkrun, obviously, because everything came back to parkrun. So I kind of went out one day and tried to do bushy parkrun course in my chair and I think I got halfway around before it just I couldn't do it like I was tired the terrain wasn't ideal and I went away and was like I'm never going to be able to do parkrun like how is this going to work and I did a lot of research and at the time I didn't really find people that were doing or wanted to do what I was doing I didn't want to just find a chair that I could take a dog for a walk I wanted to find a chair that I could go fast in and after a lot of research, I came across like a free wheel, which is essentially it clips onto your front of your foot plate. It lifts your front casters up, which are the big issue with your chair because they're the one that dig in. If you hit a stone, they dig in. So if you lift your front casters up, it's got a big wheel at the front and it just gives you much more manoeuvrability off road. And I went back and I did it. I did the whole course with the wheel um, and it took me like an hour, but I did it. And that was all I was happy. 
I'd contacted Bushy Parkrun, who had like arranged for like a guide to come around with me so that if I needed any help, they would give me help. And I went that Saturday, had a guide, and we did it in like 40 minutes, which I mean was I was like I think the guide was quite surprised because I think I'd emailed and said it might take me about 50 minutes or so, like an hour. We did it in 40 minutes. So I think that was a bit of a shock. But um then obviously it just went on from there. I just obviously got stronger naturally. My arms were quite weak, but obviously with the more training and, and I was using my chair now pretty much every day. So my arms built that strength. And then in the November, October, November, I did did the half marathon and had a guide runner for that as well. What would that mean in terms of the with with a guide runner? Is is would that be in terms of if you if you reached a part of the course that you can access yourself or something like that? Yeah. That was I mean, originally the guide runner's purpose was to help me if I needed help. If anything went wrong, that they could push me or you know, anything like that. Now, I don't think in all my time part running, a guide runner in those early stages anyway, a guide runner ever pushed me because I was so adamant I was going to do it on my own. The only time was I had a bit of an accident and I flipped my chair over and I, they did pick me up. So, but other than that, that's what the guide runner was kind of for. I think it was to alleviate, I think partly Bushy Park's concerns and also my concerns of actually, because I was going, again, still pretty much going on my own, my concern of just getting stuck somewhere and not being able to get out. Particularly, like Bushy Park run course is... It's flat, but there's got some off-roady sections, which in the wet are pretty like gnarly to try and get over and pretty rocky, so tree roots and stuff. So that was my concern. The faster I got, the guide runner's job became slightly different and was actually just to run sort of in front of me and cl- sort of clear a pathway so that I wasn't getting blocked behind people so that I could get good times. Did you have and to get so- quicker and quicker guide runners? Yes. Um, so I've got like when I go, so I don't go back to Bushy Park Run as much now. We sort of tend to tour more. But when I go back there, we went back on Saturday, and I, I, I see loads of people, obviously still park running there, that like were were my guide runners for like varying times. So the guy that did my first and maybe a couple, we were talking like forty five minutes, like forty minutes, and then I think well, I, I couldn't tell you what my fastest at Bushy is. It's probably in the twenties, twenty one minutes maybe. So obviously I've got a different guide runner. But when I was doing it later on, and I've got like a series of guide runners at different paces, and they'd be like, oh, you're too fast for me now. You'll have to find someone else. And towards the end, it was getting quite tricky to find someone that would run with me. Understandably so. But yeah, and then I think I famously left my guide runner on one, on one park run because I was going too fast towards the end. And they would just like go ahead. I felt really bad. I felt like I probably should slow down, but I cracked on. And yeah, but without them, I wouldn't have got fast times because I just wouldn't have got through the people because Bushy's busy. So... And I'm low, so not people don't see me. That's one of the biggest problems. The role has changed. I don't have a guide runner now when I go to park run, whatever park run I go to. Um, I don't have a, gu- a designated guide runner, but I tour with friends and they're always there if I need a hand. So, And I've got that confidence now, I think, in myself, my abilities. And also if I needed support that a friend wasn't there, I would ask someone and they would they would help. And, and you've obviously graduated on far beyond park run and and that original half even london marathon was always the aim you got there as well didn't you tell tell us about london london was amazing so i had a charity place because i was like i've never i've entered the ballot since i was 18 every year so even though like i say like i wasn't interested in running if i'd have got a place i'd have i'd have i'd have taken up running but i'd entered the ballot every year since i was 18 and i'd never got a place i think there was an element but at the time, maybe that had reality had set in of not really knowing what the future held because I didn't, I was worried about how far things could deteriorate. I think because there was so much unknown, I kind of wanted to do things like now. I wasn't willing to like wait. So I was like, right, let's get a charity charity place. I have a charity place for a disability charity that I did a lot of work with, um, Scope, who supported me quite a lot. Didn't really do a lot of training for it, I wouldn't say. <laughs> like In terms of, I didn't have a training plan. I've never had a training plan for anything I've ever done. I've never had a training plan. I I have a tendency to just rock up and do it. Before the half marathon, I did do four laps of the park run course because I then I knew I could do a half marathon distance. But I didn't. I don't think I ever went further than half marathon before London Marathon. I can't remember, but yeah, it was. I was nervous. I think because I was on my own as well. I mean, well, there's thousands of runners around you, but I I had didn't have anyone that I knew was running it. But it was. I remember everyone saying, take it slowly, like just enjoy it, like soak up the atmosphere, just enjoy it. And I must have been half a kilometre in. I thought, but I'll only enjoy it if I'm really pushing myself. 
and then I just shot off like um <laughs> and just went for it and I mean it was insane it, like it was probably the greatest day of my life like je- I mean it sounds like really over the top but just I felt like that sense of freedom I mean I was stuck behind so many runners for a lot of it and like couldn't get through so I suppose there was that but just I was just pushing on a closed roads around London, no curbs to navigate, none of this, just pushing, enjoying it, people cheering, shouting your name. Like it just the whole thing was incredible. Like I was on a high for, for ages afterwards. I did it in four hours and two seconds. Which but I that was I frustrating. Been, yeah, I should have been <laughs> happy with that. My dad got a grandstand seat because like I fundraised, I think fundraised about four thousand pounds or something for it. And so my dad got a grandstand seat and like he'd come to watch me and think he was quite proud because he messaged me when I crossed the finish line I was like, oh, like he cried when I crossed the finish line and he was very emotional I, I, I replied to him going mm, yes but two seconds I mean there were swear words in there as well but that was my <laughs> first reply was those mm, two seconds I loved it and I was on a high like I just it was it was the most incredible thing ever and I think yeah I just knew I wanted to do it again I had signed up for Brighton Marathon two weeks before I did that London Marathon so I had signed up for another one before I'd even done my first one I don't know why I did that. I just felt jealous. We went down to Brighton. It was Brighton Marathon weekend. I felt jealous of the runners, so I signed up for it. So I'm glad I enjoyed London. Otherwise, things could have gone a bit. But it was, I just, I had the bug for like just doing events and pushing my body. And I think it's an element of, for me, and I'll always say it's like, when I first started using my chair, I think other people around me really struggled to adjust. Just didn't know what to say. And like, they were grieving, I think, to an extent themselves. In the same way that I was like, what I'd lost. But I didn't know how to react to those people who were like struggling to accept things. Well, what are you going to do now? You know, how's how's your life going to work? So I put on this brave front of, yeah, like I can do this and I'm going to show you what I can do. And I think to start with doing those running events was just a, yeah, I'm in a wheelchair, but I'm still doing this and it's not going to stop me. So I think things like London was like a real turning point in this is me and it doesn't matter and you can accept that I can accept that and we just we just carry on and by that point you're just really enjoying what you're doing irrelevant to a degree of how you were doing it and and you've got your your hook to it I think plenty of marathons have 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 come since haven't they yeah a few uh I mean I don't I honestly don't even know how many I've done officially maybe about eight or nine officially like actual races virtually I did quite a few um, but yeah, I've done Bournemouth. I snapped my free wheel, snapped my foot plate at Bournemouth Marathon. So I was left with my casters. The path was covered in sand. So I flipped my chair over three times and has to be put back upright again. Um, didn't put me off. Enjoyed that. Did then Brighton, Manchester. And then I've done London again, like a couple of times and absolutely just loved it every time. And then this year I've done Berlin and I've done New York Marathon this year. So quite a few, quite a few marathons. Yeah. Yeah. Which has been your favourite? Oh, London, like 100% London. Like, I just, I think every year I get worried that, like, I'm not going to enjoy it as much as I did, like, the previous year. And then every year, I mean, this year was, I think, particularly good. So I think last year, COVID was around still, so it was a bit quiet. But this year was, this year was pretty special, yeah. Like, the crowds were really, like, good, back to, like, good capacity, lots of cheering. I got a PB as well, so I can't, you know, I'm not well, going to like it. I'm, I'm, I'm g- going to guess that you've got under that four hours now. What sort of time is <laughs> yeah. it now? So I did, uh, so I think my PB now is 2.53 something at London this year. Is, yeah. Are you still running with, or in the wheelchair with the general runners, or are you now, does that get you into the elite area now? So no, so I, I do have a racing chair, but I don't, I've not done a marathon in my racing chair. All the marathons I've done, and all the, mo- I mean, I'd say 90% of the races I've done have been in my day chair still. Same setup as when I first started. And it depends on the marathon as to how they organise the wheelchairs. So sometimes, even if you're not in a racing chair, the day wheelchairs. So New York, we were put with the racing elites. Berlin was the same. London, you're just in with the masses. Like it, it depends. Um, you just sort of, you have to sort of take it as it comes. Hmm. Is, is there any thoughts to sort of go down that road? Because if you're, cl- you're clocking 250 in a day chair, I'm, I'm guessing, in theory, you'd be faster in a racing chair. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so I didn't. I started wheelchair racing as in like properly, as you see at like Paralympics with proper racing chairs at last year. So only May last year. I'd kind of maybe been interested in it before that, but I kind of, like, I'm part of a running club, an able-bodied running club with my friends. And 
like that running and racing for me wasn't a competitive thing. I'm competitive against myself, but it wasn't a like I just enjoyed being doing something that I could do before I became a wheelchair user. And that's why I would say parkrun was so important because I had to stop playing all the team sport I was playing when I became a wheelchair user. So I couldn't play it anymore. So I lost all of that, but I could still go to parkrun. Parkrun's mm-hmm. the only thing that I've done pre as a, like a runner as an able-bodied person all the way through to being a wheelchair user. So I think that was really important for me. Well, that was maybe that was the reason I was doing it. It was it wasn't because I wanted to compete. I just wanted to do the things that my friends were doing. That's you know, at the end of the day. And if that was cross country, it was cross country. If that was road racing, it was road racing. And then during the pandemic, like, I was furloughed like like a lot of people and didn't have anything to do. And I really struggled with not having anything to do or something to work on. So I entered like a virtual challenge. It was like a virtual race across Tennessee. Can't remember the distance. It was quite it was over a thousand kilometers or something like that. So I sort of entered that and then started pushing like 60 70k a day and that's where like my love of like ultras came in i suppose but i did that like every day for 30 days just because i did 200 milers in a day in that time just out of nothing and no like preparation no training i've got a nutritionist now and i talked to her about like race nutrition this and the other and i think i'm still slightly skeptical because of all the stuff that i did during covid on what was essentially a bowl of weetabix and a bowl of pasta like <laughs> i'm just like well i don't know don't know much about nutrition but I probably wasn't doing it particularly right and it was kind of during that time so I hit I went out like I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning pushing up and down Bushy Park on the road that they closed and I went out and I was like I'm gonna do a 5k I did a 5k in 1851 in my day chair and I was sort of like I don't think I'm ever gonna go faster than that I think at this point it's the equipment that is is holding me back I think that is about as good as you can get in a chair in, in a day chair so I think that sort of got the cogs whirring about maybe starting like competitive wheelchair racing. And then it was off the back of that, that once sort of COVID and the pan and the lockdowns had lifted, that I then emailed our local racing club about starting to do that. And yeah, like, I would like to, it's really complicated for like disability sport because um, you need to be classified to go to the, the Paralympics and to compete at the world majors in a racing chair. And at the moment I don't have a classification because like, I don't have like finalized diagnosis. So I can't I can't go to the Paralympics at the moment because I don't have that classification. I couldn't do New York, Berlin, London, any of the world majors in my racing chair because I don't have a classification. So I've done a couple of races, like half marathons. I've won like a bit of prize money, second place, third place last year, second place this year. And I do a lot of track stuff. But I think, yes, I would love to progress in wheelchair racing. But to me, the day chair stuff is still as important at the moment i think maybe if i got classified and there was a chance to you know really progress in the sport then maybe my my balance might shift slightly but like i'll go to track training twice a week and compete with all these other wheelchair users in training Um, i'm part of david weir's academy so i train with him and and jenny archer so i do that twice a week and then they go to the park and train in their racing chairs on a saturday and during the week and I still go to park run. And I still go and get stuck in a muddy field on a Saturday morning. And I enjoy that just as much. And that's really important to me. So I think they find it strange at, at wheelchair racing that I do this stuff in my day chair. They think that's insane. And like a lot of other people say, well, why do you still do stuff in your day chair when you could do it in a racing chair? So it's getting that balance. And for me, I say at the moment, I've got pretty a pretty good balance. One thing you have been able to do and really embrace, you mentioned your love of ultras. Yeah. You, you went and did Comrades Marathon in South Africa. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that, that was, I don't, I don't know really where that came from. I think, so I was listening to like um podcast at the time. And I think I was listening to like Marathon Talk. And I remember like Tom Williams talking about doing Comrades with his dad. I just, I, I didn't know what Comrades was, like naively had no clue. So I sort of Googled it and I was like, it's a road race. Okay. Because in the UK, most ultras are off-road. So immediately I'm not going to be allowed to do it. There's so many races, even in the UK even road races in the UK, that you can't do it in a wheelchair, apparently. I could do it. You could do it in a wheelchair, but you're not allowed to do it in a wheelchair. So I looked at it and was like, oh, it's a road race. There's not many road ultras around. So I sort of did a bit of digging and there was a mention that you could do it in a wheelchair. I was like, okay. So I emailed them and said, yep, yeah, you can do it in a wheelchair. So I entered, like, on a bit of a whim. We were down visiting my grandparents and the entries opened and I was like, oh, should I just enter? And I said to my dad, I was like, oh, uh, 
I want to do Comrade. And he was like, what on earth is Comrade? And I was like, oh, it's not that expensive. It's just, but it's in South Africa. I was like, you want to go to South Africa, don't you? He was like, mm, yeah, I'll come with you. So I just entered like on this dark January, I think, whenever it was, like, a few years ago. And then COVID hit. So it got postponed. Um, and it was meant to be this like big, like that was going to be my ultra. And everyone said, why don't you do it in a few years? And I said, well, no, I want to do it now because I don't know what's going to happen in a few years health wise. So let's just do it now. And then obviously COVID delayed it anyway. In that time during the pandemic, they ran it virtually. So I did it twice the distance wise virtually. Obviously, you cannot replicate the elevation. And it was hard. It was harder than I expected, I think. But then also I was worried. I was really I've never not finished anything. Like I've always got that like massive fear of failure. So that that fear of failure drives me to finish anything. But that was the one I was worried about because of the cutoff time. I didn't know. Everyone said it was really hilly, but I didn't know how big these hills were. I've done hills before, but I didn't know how big these hills were going to be. I mean, that rivals London, comrades. Like that is the atmosphere. They get like the spectators get there at 5 a.m. in the morning, set up their barbecues and they're there for the whole day. It's a, that is a whole day out for those spectators. And it's it's the whole route. That's what I couldn't appreciate was there were very few parts of that route where there's nobody there. And I was just... It was it was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable experience. And I spent so it's 90 kilometers, just over, I think it was. And I spent about 88k of it saying, I'm never doing this again. It was been lovely, but I'm not doing this again. And then I crossed the finish line. I got grabbed by the TV company and they interviewed me and they were like, So are you gonna come back and do it again? And I was like, Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and we've booked for next year, so that's happening again next year. I want the back to back. I think that's the big thing, is getting the back to back. Not many people have self-pushed comrades, but they've got a really good sort of inclusive program running there. They they make a lot of changes and adaptions and like com- like they have the provisions there for wheelchair users. I mean, it was fought hard to get it. Um, I met up with um a girl and her mum who like fought for her to do it. Like a few years ago, she's South African. Whilst we were out there, and like they fought hard to get it, but it it is it is incredible and. I think a lot, a lot of the spectators have maybe never seen a wheelchair user push com like push comrades, or even maybe taking part in a race like that before. The crowd was so loud. I, I just, it was almost overwhelming. And we went past a school, like it was an SEND school, and a lot of the kids were in in wheelchairs. But like even my basic wheelchair, like they had far more basic wheelchairs. Like think wheelchairs that wouldn't allow them to to sort of like push around like independently like and I, I think at that point I was struggling but I sort of realized that actually me being able to do that race was a privilege like I was priv- I was in a privileged position to be able to do that race I had the equipment like financially I was able to to take the cost of going and doing it and yeah I think after that I sort of enjoyed it a bit more and realized that how sort of lucky I was fantastic Claudia we have less than a minute to go so i'm going to uh, end it there i think we could probably talk all day it's been fascinating <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on running tales thank you very much. that was good thanks for joining us on another running tales podcast it was fascinating this week to chat to claudia and i don't know about you but i feel we still have only scratched the surface of her amazing journey if you enjoyed today's podcast please leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to it it really does help us to get the podcast out there To see more of our content, you can check out our social media channels. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Running Tales Pod and on Facebook under Running Tales. We also have a YouTube channel and you can find our written articles from inspiring stories to running tips, commentary and analysis at www.runningtales.substack.com. Thanks again for joining us on this week's podcast and I look forward to seeing you next week.